On the night of July 28, 1984, a man broke into Jennifer Thompson's home, held a knife to her throat, and sexually assaulted her. She believed, she believed that if she survived, the only thing she would make sure of was to remember everything about him. Thompson was able to escape, and her only comfort was, she is, was if she was faced with her attacker, she would be able to identify uh, him with absolute cer certainty and bring him to justice. Uh, Thompson was able to compile a composite image of her attacker, and the police were able to identify a uh, Mr. Ronald Cotton. He was working close to where the crime happened, looked like the man in the sketch, had prior convictions, and even a faulty alibi. With a suspect in hand, Thompson was brought in for a photo lineup, and later a physical lineup where she identified Cotton both times with relative surety. When she picked him in the physical lineup, the investigator informed her that she had chosen the same man from the po photos. She knew then she was certain. She had done it right. She had found her attacker. That certainty was able to obtain a sentence where Cotton would spend his life in prison. If you were Thompson, do you think that your memory of this incident could ever be inaccurate? Do you believe that your recollections of these events could be manipulated, even replaced with completely false memories? The scary truth is they can. In an interview with Leslie Stahl in 60 Minutes, Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton tell us how they know all too well what misidentification and false memory can do in a criminal case. Cotton would spend 11 years of his life in jail before DNA testing would exonerate him, and Thompson would live with the guilt that made her feel much like a criminal herself. Um, there is a silver lining. They would eventually uh, become friends, writing a book about their experience, and then later uniting in their effort to change legislation regarding eyewitnesses. Um, eyewitness testimony does need to remain an essential tool in criminal cases. However, it is imperative that the legal system gains a better understanding of how human memory works and develops legislation reg regulating how it is collected in order to make its best effort to avoid mistaken identifications. Since 75% of wrongful incriminations are due to an accurate eyewitness testimony, it is essential that the legal system makes changes in how they use this key evidence. According to social psychologist Gary Wells, there are several areas in which the legal system can improve how it obtains its eyewitness testimony and help to eliminate false identifications. Uh, first, he suggests that memory evidence be treated as trace evidence, um, much, like blood and fingertip, or <laughs> blood, much like blood and fingerprints and recognize that just like physical evidence, it can be tampered, often by the procedures used to collect it. Uh, two areas that seem to need the greatest changes in how they are conducted are photo and physical lineups. Police lineup procedures for both photo and physical lineups have shown to have many variables that may indirectly produce inaccurate results. In the case of Thompson, she was shown a photo lineup that contained several photos of different men and was given ample time to identify the suspect. Uh, Wells, who studies psychology's impact on law with an emphasis on proving the accuracies of eyewitness testimony, says the problem with this is that it should really be only one photo at a time, because trying to recognize and differentiate between different faces at the same time can cause confusion and inaccuracies. He also believes that uh, the amount of time Thompson spent looking at these photos is not reflective of recognition memory, um, and one should actually be able to recognize someone within seconds or not at all. He also believes many changes could be implemented in physical lineups as well. The physical lineup should only be one suspect and the rest is known innocence. That way it would eliminate the chance that if a witness did pick the wrong suspect, it would not result in a wrongful conviction. He also believes that a possible solution may be a sequential lineup, which is like the photo lineup where people are presented one at a time to the witness and possibly um, helping to eliminate the manipulation of facial uh, rec recognition. The most influential part of lineups on eyewitnesses may be the unconscious cues that investigators give them uh, when conducting lineups. When Jennifer Thompson was going through her lineup choices, she was assured at the end of the physical lineup that she had chosen the same man in both the photo and physical lineup. The problem with this sort of feedback is it can create a false surety that may not have been present had the investigator said nothing, or better yet, been a neutral party who did not know who the possible suspect was. Wells also warns that confidence in eyewitness testimony may not be de the determining factor in whether they are accurate. Eyewitnesses' confidence is the most convincing determinant in whether testimony will be used as evidence. The fact is people believe in their false memories and will often convey high confidence in their recollections. Highly confident witnesses do produce more accurate results, um, but a high percentage are still mistaken, that, as well as there are non-confident witnesses that are accurate. It would be a mistake to let an entire case be based on the confidence of a witness. In the case of Thompson and Cotton, Thompson was 100% sure she had caught the man who raped her. Cotton says that her testimony was so powerful that even he felt for her. The woman who was making sure he went to jail. A year later, when working in prison, Cotton met Thompson's actual rapist, Bobby Poole. Bobby would even break to other inmates about what he had done and how he had gotten away with it. 
This new evidence would earn Cotton a second trial, and he believed he even had a chance when other inmates corroborated what he had said about Poole. That was until Thompson took the stand. Thompson was as convinced as ever that Cotton was her perpetrator. She didn't even recognize Poole. Um, Poole would actually uh, later be found guilty uh, through DNA evidence um, that was found through the Innocence Project. Uh, in, that, in the time that Poole was free, he went on um, to claim multiple victims. Uh, Thompson would also never get um, closure with Poole as he had died in prison before the DNA evidence came to light. Cotton and people like him are only given a chance at DNA testing due to organizations like the Innocence Project. To date, the Innocence Project was acqui has acquitted over 250 people of crimes they didn't commit, some of them spending decades of their lives behind bars and some even dying before they are exonerated. Experts all believe that these cases must not happen and, in, and it's an issue that all states must accept responsibility for and create new le legislation regarding eyewitness testimony and memory handling. Uh, Wells, Thompson, Cotton, and the Innocence Proje Project all believe that through careful handling of the human memory and educating how it works, there could be a great reduction in false accusations from happening. The benefits of new legislation could save people from life-changing imprisonment, the guilt forced onto unaware accusers, and the capture of actual criminals who often continue to commit crimes while still free. Eyewitness testimony needs to remain a vital part of the legal system, but proper treatment of the evidence is imperative to diminish these life-altering mistakes.